Okay, the Gut Club welcomes Stephen Wright on our maiden voyage here, our first ever podcast. We chose Stephen because his expertise is in, well, many fields. The field of butyrate is what we're going to be discussing today. Thank you for being here, Stephen. Thanks, Keith. Thanks for having me on the Gut Club. I appreciate it. Uh, we're excited to have you. What, what? Where are you located? You're in Colorado, right? Uh, yeah, normally in Colorado. Currently, we're in Scottsdale uh, for some, some family stuff at the moment. Okay, nice. Um, I'm broadcasting from uh, Palm Beach County, Florida. Okay. If I got on my bike, I could be at Mar-a-Lago in about 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, uh, not that I want to go, but who knows? Actually, I like to go there and say hello. Okay, so let's talk first a little bit about your history. I became aware of you before starting the Gut Club, actually, in which began at the end of 2015. I was on to you and your work with the SCD diet. Um, and how far back does that go? I may be misremembering the timeline here. But... Uh, our first, uh, the, the, the launch of the website, the launch of the company was in, in 2009, in late 2009, uh, was when Jordan and I, my, my co-founder and good friend, took the, the company SC Lifestyle Live. Uh, and then we had our ebook and our blogs kind of up in 2010 there. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'm not hallucinating you. Yeah, I was definitely um, aware of you and uh, was really intrigued because actually in about 2012, I was kind of a peripheral part of the paleo community at the Ancestral Health Symposium and actually gave a, a poster presentation in 2013 um, at all about intestinal health and microbial imbalance. Back then, you know, people were just beginning to get in into it. Um, were you at that symposium in 2013 at, at the Ancestral Health Symposium? Is that the one in Boston? Um, no, that was Atlanta. Okay. I think I was at the Atlanta one and the Boston one. Uh, those okay. are the only two I made it to. Yeah. So the SCD diet has helped a lot of people. And I'm wondering, you know, based on what you've learned over the years regarding butyrate, you may have some second thoughts about the SCD. That's the specific carbohydrate diet, because when you're removing those important prebiotic fibers or, you know, carbs in general, um, how do you think that's affecting butyrate producers? And, and do you re recommend it long-term? What do you think these days? Yeah, I think it's, it's extremely complex. And so you have to, if you're looking for a simple answer, you're not going to find it on this show today. <laughs> um, and yeah. Yeah. so the answer is, I don't, I don't buy doing the specific carbohydrate diet, long-term gaps, uh, FODMAP, uh, any of the carbohydrate restricting diets uh, long-term, because as you mentioned, the studies are showing now, especially with the FODMAP diet that around week six to week eight, there is a, a significant decline in the butyrate producing species. And so, mm -hmm. um, which only just makes sense from an ecological perspective, if you take away nature's food source for something, then the, the, the life that lives on that food is going to decline. And so um, the complexity comes in, in that it does appear that the majority of people who are having uh, gut issues typically are having trouble with carbohydrate um, digestion. And so they, they struggle with, I mean, plenty of people struggle with fat digestion and, and protein digestion as well, but complex carbohydrates and the process of digesting those, the loss of, of enzymes and other, other things important for that, and or maybe you, you already have gut dysbiosis, then you can't break down those, those complex carbohydrates, creates this sort of chicken and egg situation where I, I still think that a short term, meaning like less than 60 day sort of uh, restricted diet or elimination diet, and then reintroduction is still very effective and very helpful for anyone suffering with gut issues. I think the goal has to be though, the conversation has to move towards, you know, you don't do this without butyrate protection. You don't do this without um, any other uh, prebiotics or probiotics or whatever your plan is. Your plan is to go on the, the restricted diet and immediately start you know, using your support supplements to get your diet corrected as fast as possible. So you can re-expand those, those food. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a, like a, a paleo diet 
you know, any kind of low carb diet might be very helpful for about a month. Um, and people have been on carnivore diets to great effect. Also, um, you know, I fully support these things, especially short term. But long term, I've seen some people get into trouble um, and not being able to digest a so called healthy diet. I recently saw in fact, it was just published this week about ferment a fermented milk product. And of course, the gut club is marketing uh, kefir grains, a fermented milk product, they used only uh, bifidobacteria to make the fermented milk, but it helped people that are really between a rock and a hard place when it comes to being able to digest a so-called healthy diet, you know, so interesting to consider that. So yeah, you've come a long way. I mean, uh, basically, I mean, you've, you know, you've, you know, if people tracked your history, they might say, well, this is someone who's had some epiphanies in, in life. Um, how have these things helped you personally? What do you, what's, what's your story? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a, so I've had gut issues from birth. So I was born with a, with a birth defect called a hydrocele hernia, which is where the ball sac doesn't completely close and usually pinches or, or at least aggravates the intestines. Um, and so I was a, a failure to thrive child until week 12, when uh, my mom finally convinced a doctor to take a look at me. They're kind of writing her off back then. Um, and so, you know, at some level, pharmaceuticals, antispermatic drugs saved my life and modern medicine saved my life. And I kind of got a um, raw poker hand, if you will, of, hmm. of introduction into the world. And then, you know, that followed sort of a, a typical timeline of, of, you know, plenty of like pretty good food growing up and plenty of outdoor activity and things like that. But then I had mm -hmm. cystic acne and I had a top dermatologist in the area give me four years straight of Bactrim DS, which is a pretty strong antibiotic. And so I wound up in the hospital uh, with all bifidobacter in my gut at wow. that point. I, wow. I've, um, seen, I've seen some yeah. similar charts. Yeah. Well, congratulations. You've survived and now you're helping other people survive. Um, yeah. I think that's where it often comes from, right? Like we use our pain to manifest it and, and, you know, help ourselves and then try to help others along the path as well. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite bits of humor is when I was a child, I had um, a doctor that decided I need to be on allergy shots. This is in the, in the 1960s. Um, I was driving into Chicago every two weeks and then every month to get a shot and having sore arms, you know, even when I got back there. Um, but lo and behold, when Dr. Kaplan died, I didn't need allergy shots anymore. So, I tried those for a while too. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Yeah. 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 Maybe, if he, maybe if he would have uh, known about microbial regulation of immune response, I would have been on probiotics instead of, instead of uh, constant shots. That's, that's a big topic for the day. Maybe we'll save that one for another time. Um, so natural immunity, that, that's, that's what I've been trying to promote and educate myself about. Um, okay, so yeah, you, you've, you've come a long way and, and you have several products with Healthy Gut Company. Today, we're going to be focusing on Tributerin X. I have a bottle here on my desk. This, I've been testing a couple bottles personally. I'm not addressing any particular health issue. You know, I've been trying to notice anti-inflammatory action, also perhaps better sleep, as I know people um, have, have talked about. Um, and frankly, I haven't noticed a lot personally. I think I may have, um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep trying. I only take one, one, uh, one pill, one gel at a time, and I, maybe a higher dose would help. I happen to know my own microbial balance, and I have a, a lot of butyrate producers. I've been fortunate there. Um, so for, not, for other people, though, I think there may be a different story. Can you tell me any success stories? G give me your favorite success story with this product. And then we'll talk about what it is and what butyrate is. And we'll talk about the literature. Yeah, sure. Well, let I'll, I'll give you three, three sort of anecdotal stories. And of course, these aren't representative of what happens for everybody. But, um, you know, on, on the fun, and it's, I guess it's, none of this is actually fun. I mean, the results are fun. But um, like we have a team member on the team who, uh, who, whose wife grabbed the bottle of Trebunerin X after I had talked about the sleep benefits and she doesn't have any, you know, digestive issues according to her. Um, mm -hmm. but she now takes one before bed and has noticed her, her sleep scores higher on the aura ring. 
Yeah. And so, I mean, there's, there's really nice anecdotal stuff around that. Um, mm -hmm. There is uh, a woman who was so reactive to histamines and, and uh, anything producing histamine that a strawberry put her in a hospital uh, last year. Mm. And then she used Tributerinex for, I think, around seven or eight months. And she had a glass of red wine at Thanksgiving uh, with her family th this year. And so that's that if you know much about histamine and mast cell activation and like what all the whole process of that, that's like a really, really big deal to that group of people. It is. Um, it's, a, it's a very big deal regarding COVID also. There's a, a lot of literature uh, that you can find about mast cell issues and, and immune response. I have to dig deeper in that. But go ahead, please. Yeah. And then, um, and then the other one is, uh, just this awesome lady who, uh, had never had a foreign bowel movement. And I think she was in her fifties, her entire life. And she was refractory on all prescription medications, all combinations, you know, it's been a long time. She's been trying to solve for this and she was able to use a, a really high dose, uh, four pills, four times a day wow. and, uh, have a, uh, formed bowel movement. So it's a massive range from one pill a day to, you know, 16 pills a day. And it's, it's very dependent upon the individual, what you're solving for, what you're using in combination, you know, speaking with your healthcare provider to work this into the, the program, things like that. You know, there, there may be some common ground between things like improved sleep and the potential for an adverse reaction with a butyrate supplement being constipation in my understanding. And um, maybe the crossroads is how it affects the gut-derived neurotransmitter balance. Um, I've been thinking about this and I found some research and I'll, I'll try to find it and share, or share the screen, um, but it's about how tryptophan is moving and how butyrate affects that um, across the cell. I have to, you know, I should have uh, gotten, uh, you know, gotten that up this morning and, and reminded myself, but I was fascinated to see this because maybe this is explaining things. You know, tryptophan is the precursor to serotonin, which is the precursor to melatonin. And high levels of serotonin are actually associated with diarrhea. Low levels of gut-derived serotonin are associated with um, constipation. So maybe butyrate is affecting that balance. And then in terms of gut-brain axis, we know that gut-derived melatonin does cross the blood-brain barrier. Meanwhile, gut-derived serotonin does not. Even though it's 95% of all the serotonin in our body, in our bodies, tryptophan needs to cross the blood-brain barrier in order to be the precursor for serotonin. So that impacts, you know, a lot of things, um, you know, from the serotonergic to the glutamatergic system. And yeah. Could it could explain things like like sleep and migraine and um, all kinds of, of issues. Butyrate is such a deep subject. We're going to do a quick glance. <laughs> I mean, it, it's so widespread that I can't really grasp it all yet. I mean, um, there, there is, you know, hats off to you for running with this. Um, you know, you're one of the first, if not the first, to market tributyrin, which is a different form of, of butyrate. Uh, and butyrate, of course, for people that don't know this yet, it is, it is found in, in diet. For instance, it's part of um, noni fruit. Have you heard of noni? I think I'm pronouncing yeah, yeah. noni. Yeah. You know, it's, noni is also known as vomit fruit. And butyrate is a component of vomit. Have you heard this before? No, this, no. Oh, this is news. Okay. Maybe, you know, this, this explains why people maybe shouldn't, you know, break open the capsules because the smell and the taste might be quite offensive. Oh, it is. It's terrible. Yeah. In fact, I'll try to show a video in a little bit. Um, I became aware of this, gosh, 10 or so years ago. Greenpeace was using butyric acid bombs to throw on whaling ships to spoil the whale um, meat and make conditions so terrible on the deck of the of these whaling ships that they couldn't operate so you know they're called stink bombs yeah A anyway noni is also got a lot of of you know this vomit fruit as it's called um it's got a lot of anti-cancer properties too and butyrate is known to you know to inhibit um cancer as an 
um, HDAC inhibitor. I, I, you know, I'm not an expert in this area, but you know, we're talking about the workings of the cell and protecting against uh, DNA mutation. So, I mean, that's a pretty important factor. Um, but I think we'll focus more so on things like how butyrate is able to lead to microbial homeostasis, you know, as opposed to yeah. dysbiosis in the gut. And, you know, because without butyrate and, and you have dysbiosis, especially in the small intestine, you have, you know, what I like to refer to as the begin beginning of the end. So um, happy holidays, everybody. Okay, so butyrate, we, we know what it is, but what's tributyrin? That's a different form of butyrate. Yeah, yeah. So there's, you know, the first generation, so there's butyric acid, which is just the butyrate, which, which, as you mentioned already, it, it smells terrible. It, it, it is like the deepest vomit smell maybe you've ever experienced with yourself or your kids or something. And, mm -hmm. and so that's why um, we do not recommend you open the capsules unless you're looking for that type of experience. Um, uh, you know, I guess some people might be curious, but I, I really don't recommend it. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously us humans are, you know, we need things palatable. And so one of the first ways to, to make anything stable, also uh, butyric acid is a bit volatile when it comes to oxygen exposure. Uh, and so one of the first things to do in chemistry is always to bond something with the salt. And so that's where sodium butyrate was, you know, created. And that's the, the most studied form of, of butyric acid. Um, I like to call it generation one. You know, that was the first version that they could really start to roll out uh, in stable format and, and, and experiment with humans. Now, tributyrin is a fat-backed um, butyric acid. So there's three butyric acid molecules on a glycerol backbone. And so this creates a pharmacokinetically superior form because you don't have the sodium, which can create issues in the gut. Um, and it also causes a different digestive uh, process. So sodium crosses the small intestine wall on a, on a gradient. So basically sodium butyrate is absorbed almost immediately upon entry into the small intestine. And now the research on sodium butyrate is, is solid. It's really great actually. Mm -hmm. um, however, it's sort of capped on its upside and there's not been a lot of toxicity studies done because of the about 30% of the weight is sodium. And so you start getting up in these higher gram dosages and you have a lot of sodium coming into the body, which if you've ever, if you've ever fasted and, and like felt like you're low on electrolytes and you take too much salt water, you can actually cause diarrhea. Um, if you, if you do that, so you got the, you know, the salt and electrolytes is a very tight, tight window inside the body. So, um, tributyrin is sort of this next generation that they've been using for actually for three decades as well. There's some really cool studies, uh, back in the, the late nineties, early two thousands, where they were using it in cancer patients, they got up to 42,000 milligrams a day of oral tributyrin, uh, which is an amazing uh, study if you look at it from a safety and uh, safety perspective, because they were having these, these cancer patients take immense amounts of oral tributyrin, and their, their side effects were really only mild for a study like that, meaning they had some nausea, some, some uh, you know, pooping issues, a bit of one person had some blood sugar issues, but that's like really mild when you're talking about a, a study like that. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be the equivalent of taking essentially the entire bottle of tributyrin X all mm -hmm. in one setting. Mm -hmm. So uh, I love the safety profile data that we have on it in humans. And then mm -hmm. there's some studies in animals uh, around like pig lung um, cells and where they sort of drop all these different types of butyric acid, sodium butyrate, tributyrin, and they sort of did a dose response to see what would happen as you, uh, as you look at this lung tissue. And sodium butyrate has more of a U-curve where uh, it basically is helping and then it hurts at too high of a dosage. Tributyrin had more of like a curve or a line that was like up and to the right. So the more you gave, the more anti-inflammatory it was. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. On top of that, the cool thing for humans is is that it is the uh, backed by backed by fat sort of molecule, which yeah. means that you need lipase to liberate the butyric acid, which basically creates a time-released compound inside the small intestine. And okay. so the goal is to get that deeper, you know, trying to coat the entire intestine. Okay, my understanding is that's we're talking about pancreatic lipases that that are needed to metabolize 
tributyrin to, to butyrate. Is that correct? Is that the, the general idea? Don't you also uh, market a, a an enzyme product that might you know be complementary? What's yeah, that? yeah. So, so we make a holozyme. We make an activated full mm -hmm. full spectrum, full pH spectrum enzyme. Um, mm -hmm. I'm also very proud of that. I think we're pushing the edge on enzyme technology as well. Yeah, I need to um, experiment with that. You know what? I I did a lot of research about sodium butyrate. But before I forget to ask, have you known anyone that was testing sodium butyrate um, and did not find it effective? But when they switched to tributyrin there was a, an effect? Yeah, we have a growing population of, of uh, health practitioners and doctor's offices switching to this form because they tested it with their patients. They uh, they ran stool tests before and after and didn't see much movement in, in butyrate producing species, things like that. So um, yeah, that was actually my experience as well. I, you know, I became aware of the but butyrate research maybe about six years ago. And every time I would try, oh, I started with the resistant starch because that resistant starch was like really huge in the paleo community, like seven years ago or something like oh, that. Yeah. Yeah. But by, by the way, in 2013, I, I was really motivated to talk about microbes because the previous year at the symposium, there was like a 90 minute session on safe starches. And mm. not, and with with some real experts on the panel, um, great people, but I was just really, uh, you know, intrigued to find that there was no mention of bacteria the entire time. So you were, you were ahead of the game, man. You you've been ahead looking I, at it from a different angle. I, I think they, they people may have been thinking about it, but they were afraid to lose credibility. I think maybe by talking about it yet, and uh, even today the, the scientific community is is not talking about things they should be. That, We'll save that for, for another day. But yeah, think, you know, the world has changed though. So um, that's interesting that you found that people have found improvement using tributyrin. In fact, when I discovered tributyrin in the literature, I then looked into products. That's how I found you were beginning to market tributyrin X. And that's when I reached out to you to learn about a possible affiliate program. Um, the Gut Club handpicks our affiliates. We only have a few. Um, and I, I think that butyrate is one of the more important things that people need to be testing. Um, you know, there, there are a couple others that we'll talk about in future podcasts. So, you know, so anyway, the, the gut clubs um, code, if you'd like a, a discount is when you go to the healthy gut website is gut club 15. So we'll, we'll post a link to that in, in the description later. Okay, so why don't why don't we do this now? Why don't why don't I share a screen, and we can take a little dive for about you know five ten minutes into some of the literature and talk about some of these things. Yeah, sounds uh, good. Yeah, we we've covered a lot of ground already. Why don't we do this? And I think I just want to like mention what you just said there as you're pulling that up, which is okay. that okay. Uh, I think that anyone who's who's trying to handle their gut issues, anyone who's trying to handle chronic health issues, or just, just anti-aging for that matter. I think whether it's our tributyrin or another tributyrin product, although I, I really only like sun butyrate as the only other really product I give my A-OK -okay to, mm -hmm. um, it, it has to be something on your list of things to test uh, and, and give it like a fair shake where you do try to find your ideal dosage. You, you do try mm -hmm. to uh, you know, look at some things because it is one of the most, you know, I don't want to be like, I, I, I'm not trying to like sell miracle pills. In fact, I'm like the number one buyer of anything that's a miracle to test it on myself. That's just, that's just what I do, but mm -hmm. I, I have never seen anything affect people's guts in a positive, in, in an overwhelmingly positive way, the mm -hmm. way this product has. Mm -hmm. And we do offer a 60 day money back guarantee and we offer free free support and free coaching, because we know that this can be complicated. And we know that for some percentage, three to 4% of all of our buyers, they're going to, it's not going to work. And they're for a, a thousand different reasons, mm -hmm. but the overwhelming majority of people and the sort of the, the case studies and the testimonials and the customer feedback on this product has been, I've never seen anything better in the, in the 12 years of gut health that I've been wow. doing. That's fascinating. Uh, so, um, yeah, let's 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 dive into the research for a moment. But be but before we do, you mentioned optimal dose. What is the procedure you recommend to find your optimal dose? 
So, so we recommend that you go one pill every three days, starting with dinner. So, and build your way up. Now you also need to take into context what you're trying to solve for. Are you trying to solve for better sleep? Are you trying to solve for uh, better food tolerance? Like you want to expand your diet to include more food you can't. Are you trying to solve for loose stools or, or something else? Um, you know, uh, those things will matter. People who are on the loose stool spectrum tend to need more. People who are on the constipated spectrum tend to need less. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously the more sensitive you are, meaning like, people who have multiple chemical sensitivities or have, they know they have pet and all kinds of dander allergies. Uh, mm -hmm. They know they have food sensitivities. You should go slower. People who are a little bit uh, more tolerant can go a little faster, but in general, your body will, will pretty much tell you when you, when you're at too much and you'll just feel kind of sluggish. Your mm -hmm. bowels won't be uh, you know, Bristol number fours anymore. They won't happen every day. You might even feel a little constipated. Just go one pill down from that. So let's mm -hmm. say you got to four pills. You were feeling great at three. You're like, what, what can happen at four? Maybe, you know, maybe I'll sleep even better. Um, and you felt sluggish and slower that day, then just, then three is probably your ideal dosage um, at that mm -hmm. point. And so it, it's, it's sort of like a tolerance test as you sort of move up the, the spectrum there. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I think it's always good to start low and slow, as they say, <clears throat> with anything new to, to avoid an adverse reaction. But I think there's a you know, pretty high tolerance here. It's a pretty safe product and, and well studied. Yeah, but also, you, you know, we're going about to talk about it, but you can have remodeling that can happen quickly. And so you can, you know, that's why we say one pill every three days, because a lot of people think, well, I'm strong, or I'm this or that. But um, it can cause a remodeling in your microbiome pretty quickly. And if you're taking like, if you just hop in and take two pills on the first day and then two pills the next day, you know, people do, you know, email us, message us and say like, oh no, now I feel nauseous and, and I'm having loose stools. And I'm like, well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we need to slow down, just slow down, let your yeah. gut remodel around this because it, it is a potent, potent compound. Yeah. Do you... <clears throat> You mentioned with dinner, do you recommend taking this with food or, or on an empty stomach? Um, it can be done on either. Uh, mm -hmm. So, but it just makes a little bit more sense to me to take it when you'd have uh, fermenting fiber in your mm -hmm. gut, sort of along with okay. the process. I have a, a little cocktail that I've invented that I've been testing with my tr uh, tributarin X. Uh, you know, please feel free to laugh, but I've been combining it with vitamin D3 for one reason. Um, the active form of vitamin D has been found to be associated with butyrate producing bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an interesting, you know, uh, thing. And, and of course, vitamin D is so crucial these days, especially, you know, we know it's balancing flora in the small intestine and um, is so important to preventing uh, COVID-19. In fact, I think our governments should be giving uh, vitamin D away. The UK was doing that for a while um, last year, but they stopped for this season and it's cheaper than a bag of dirt. So for that not to be given away is really a travesty. Um, but I also combine it with cod liver oil um, and um, CoQ10. So these are, you know, I'm not sure if this cocktail, you know, is a nice combination. So I have had no adverse reaction to it, but you know, they're, they're all, you know, in the form of fats. So you have your cod liver oil, your, um, you know, which is high in our omega fatty acids that convert to endocannabinoids that are anti-inflammatory. Um, anyway, that's, that's my thought. Um, D3, tributarin, CoQ10, and uh, cod liver oil. I like okay. it. All right, great. I get your approval on that. A um, little, little embarrassing. My, my supplement protocol is, you know, probably, uh, you know, it's developed over the years. I just turned 60 this year. So I'm, you know, I'm fighting metabolic syndrome with all my heart. <laughs> all right, let's for you. Thank you. Thank uh, you, you don't look 60. Oh, oh boy. But, but I really am. Um, I'm, I've been jumping rope. <laughs> okay, let, let me share my screen. Um, here we go. This is our page on the gutclub.org um, about tributarin. 
And here you can find information about, um, you know, about the product. And so, in fact, let me, um, let me move this over. Okay, so this, this contains a lot of information, including a link to this photo we have. I like to call these photo explorations on the Gut Club because we post a photo and there are dozens of these and then post relevant research underneath the photo. So if you were to click on this photo and we'll do that in a moment, it would take you directly to the Gut Club page. Before we do that, I'd wanna show you this other photo and how butyrate is also connected to the skin, um, a healthy gut skin axis and how you need butyrate which is actually cross-fed uh, from the lactic acid bacteria, including uh, lactobacillus and, and uh, bifidobacteria. They cross-feed lactate and acetate to the butyrate producers in order to produce butyrate. So a probiotic is also quite complementary with uh, tributernex. Um, so when butyrate is higher, it was shown no eczema. When butyrate is lower, it was responsible for um, for eczema. So that's that's an, an amazing an amazing thing to consider the the gut skin axis. But let's click on this photo. It takes us directly to uh, the Facebook page of the Gut Club, and that should be opening up. Yeah, and and this we started this exploration uh, April two thousand nineteen, and this is I think one of the key areas. You know, underneath this, under underneath this um, this photo, right now we've got uh, 40 comments. No, I'm sorry, 63 comments. So there's quite a lot of literature. We're not going to spend the time today going through all of it, but I want to get at least this issue um, to to be made clear and the power of butyrate and really the requirement of butyrate for for the mammalian gut to keep things in balance. And this is about how the colonocytes of the intestine are basically using butyrate as a signaling molecule to then soak up oxygen. And that's really important because most of the pathogenic bacteria are aerobic bacteria. And in fact, you sent me a, an article um, earlier this morning Stephen, that I already had up on my screen because I wanted to really hammer this home. Dietary butyrate uh, suppresses inflammation through modulating. Oh, uh, hold on, that's not the one. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, this is the one in in a high fat um, diet. So, you know, it's it's a mouse study, but it's still quite instructive because it's mainly about reducing endotoxins which are the product of gram negative bacteria. So you know, that, that's an amazing you know, thing to consider when we're talking about butyrate, lowering oxygen so that flora is shifted toward the anaerobic bacteria, which are the firmicutes. Um, and let's, or some people would say firmicutes. Um, in fact, there are new names for phyla that I'm not sure are going to be uh, respected. They, they just came out um, earlier this year. There, there are new names for all the, the bacteria that's making life difficult. But let me see if I, I want to like see if I can describe this at a high level, and you tell me if if it's excellent. under if you understand it the same excellent. way. Excellent. So um, what I tell people is that basically the colonocytes, uh, when when they're doing like 90% of their metabolism through butyrate uh, metabolism, they suck oxygen out of the 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 colon area or the lower small intestine area wherever wherever this is located um uh, it's a it's a very oxygen heavy metabolism with butyrate and so that keeps the the oxygen levels really low and the ph low which is what we want to have the right microbiome conditions for the bugs to even grow and then as this thing shows so amazingly well is that as the the gradient of oxygen grows actually shifts it just literally by shifting just like you shift from the north to the south in the hemisphere you shift mm -hmm. the type of species that are available to grow you literally 
just create the conditions for dysbiosis by not having the appropriate butyrate metabolism in the cells. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. I mean, so, you know, to me, this, the reason I posted this photo as our initial conversation starter um, is just how important this, this is, you know, there are so many things about butyrate, but this alone is enough to start thinking about it and, and considering testing a butyrate supplement um, because it relates to also healthy aging. Uh, you know, as we age, we're losing these butyrate producers. You know, if you look at, and, you know, at how things change over time, you know, we, you know, in fact, you could, you could uh, market this product as anti-aging, basically. There's so many things you could market it as. You know, I talked about doing a poster. In fact, here it is, I have it up on the screen. This is a 2013 poster, um, water-based sanitation and negative effect on flora balance. That's what I pre presented at, at AHS uh, 13. And it was all about, you know, microbial imbalance um, related to childhood growth stunting. And you can download this poster on this website. Um, so, you know, childhood growth, growth stunting is another important issue where proteobacteria are overgrown and children don't have the ability to grow. There are 40 million children that are stunted in India alone. I've read one out of three children in Haiti. And this includes cognitive deficits. So, you know, this is a, a, a sanitation and nutrition issue. That's, that's natural immunity. It's about microbial balance. So yeah, butyrate might help in this area. Um, you know, right now we're doing things like feeding peanut cocktails um, and prebiotics to children um, in the developing world to address the global um, stunting issue. It's such a, an issue near and dear to my heart. I would love to be involved in a project that, that addresses this. And, and butyrate is one of those things. I'd like to bring kefir to this uh, table also. Um, and also improved sanitation. That's what that poster is all about. It's the poor sanitation that's known to be a cause of childhood growth stunting. So let's, let's dive a little bit deeper into what a healthy microbial balance really is um, related to this dynamic of lowering oxygen in, in the gut. Because, you know, there are some people that would say, we don't know what a healthy, you know, microbial balance is. I, I think they're not paying attention. We do know. And um, so let's, let's get into that. First of all, here's something we posted in 2016. Look, look at how you have homeostasis here with, you know, Bacteroides and, you know, and Clostridia, which is the main group in Formicutes, um, outweighing proteobacteria, these, these aerobic bacteria. But here you have a problem where antibiotics are given, lowering these protective bacteria and raising proteobacteria. Again, I, I would refer to this as the beginning of the end. So when we look at a chart about what a healthy balance really is, these are the major phyla of the gut. And here, the Formicutes are the main butyrate producers. They're cross-fed, as I mentioned earlier, by lactobacillus and, and bifidobacteria with acetate and lactate to produce butyrate. The, the butyrate producers then produce CO2, which cross-feeds the, meth the methanogens. So, you know, it's this domino theory for, of, of balance in the gut. And CO2 is a huge gut-brain issue as well. I, we're not going to get into that right now, but you know, low levels of CO2 is, is a big issue. Um, so, you know, so here we see what a balance, you know, a general balance is. And you know, most of the bacteria are comprised of the Bacteroidetes and the Formicutes. And in fact, if you raise Bacteroidetes, there's also some, you know, some interplay with Formicutes. When you're raising the healthy Bacteroidetes, you're also raising Formicutes. So you're working both sides of the aisle to raise butyrate. Interesting, interesting area. So very much so. Yeah. Oh, you know, I, I have this on my screen. I don't know if you can see. Can you see this? Here's the whale wars I yeah. mentioned. Um, yeah, I remember this. watching this back in the day. Really? Yeah, here, oh, yeah. here they are throwing the stink bombs onto uh, the whaling ships, the butyric acid bombs. 
Um, I thought this was a riot. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you can hear the, the audio. Um, no, no. And okay. I don't know how much of this you should play because I think there might be some copyright stuff. I don't. Oh, I don't okay. Know. Okay. We'll stop it now. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's basically it. But here, you know, if you were to go down our list of, um, of things, gosh, some of the most recent things at the bottom are very interesting. Well, here's a, a sodium butyrate article. This is the most recent things thing we've posted about inhibiting pathogenic yeast. You know, Candida is a big issue. So have, have you heard about this dynamic about lowering yeast with tributyrin? I, I haven't looked into this yet. No, no. It's interesting to consider exactly how that's happening. It, you know, it may be about, you know, also well, you know what, before I speak, I, I need to learn more about this. This is something I just investigated. You have to ask the right questions to find the right answers. And I wanted to find out if there was some kind of a relationship between butyrate and candida. And sure enough, there is. This, is, this goes back to 2011. Go ahead. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the way that I'm trying to, trying to get the message out there about this, just at a conceptual level, is that like butyrate is, is, uh, the magnesium of the gut. And it's, mm -hmm. it's my, my point there is just that magnesium is in, involved in over 300 uh, chemical reactions all around the body. If you're, if you're deficient in magnesium, you, you exhibit all types of, of symptoms and they can be neurological to uh, cognitive uh, or cognitive neurological are usually the same, but they can be, mm -hmm. you know, stunted growth. It could be all kinds of things. And I think the same thing is true with butyrate. You can literally um, I've, I've done a whole research rabbit hole on, on bone loss and osteoporosis and how butyrate can help uh, essentially stimulate parathyroid hormone, uh, which helps with bone mass. In mice, they give sodium butyrate and they have reduction in bone loss, increase in bone mass. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just did a, a, a talk on uh, butyrate and liver and, and sort of NASH and NAFLD and sort of how... Uh, butyrate is reduced in people with, with uh, NASH and NAFLD. Uh, in mice, there's like five studies now where they give uh, a type of butyrate and they see uh, protection against a high fat diet and or endotoxins in the liver. And so it, it seems like wherever you go and you start to look, butyrate's there. And I think yeah. that's the message I want to get out there because we're still discovering it. Like you just said, we, we're, 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 this is like, cutting edge. Yeah, I totally agree with you. The more you look, the more it's echoed that reduced or absent, you know, butyrate producers, it applies to every, every problem. Um, you know, it's everywhere, including COVID-19. So why don't we, why don't we call it a day for now, Stephen, and let's, let's continue this conversation in 2022. You know, I, I wish you and your family the best the best year ahead. And I, and I look forward to continuing this conversation and this partnership with you. Let's, let's try to get the word out because I think we can help a lot of people um, by just having awareness. You, do you have anything yeah. you want to say in closing? What do you think? Um, just, just feel free to, you know, email me and, and the team at support a healthy gut. If you have any questions based on this, this conversation, um, I just want to reiterate that Trevita next doesn't treat or diagnose anything um, you know, upper respiratory tract or not. Uh, and yeah, I, I just want people to, to get the health outcomes they want. And so if, mm -hmm. if Tributerin X and or other butyric acid products can get you there, I think it should be on your list of, of things to try in 2022. And then of course, if you're going to do it, please use the gut club 15, uh, coupon to get $15 off and free shipping, um, through, through Keith. Fantastic. Fantastic. I'm proud, you know, to to be a, an affiliate of your company, Stephen, and I'm I'm going to look into the uh, the enzyme products as well. So I want to thank you for for your work, your long work for many years. You've been helping this community, um, and uh, and not looking your age in the in the process. How old are you, by the way? I forgot <laughs> to ask. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm 36. You're th okay. All right. Well, you're 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 in for a long, healthy life with this kind of awareness, as far as I'm concerned. 
So let's like I said, I'm digging out of a hole uh, that that goes many stories deeper. And so, yeah, that's that's the goal. Mine too. Mine too. I've almost resigned myself to a breastfed baby poop FMT when, when I'm 80 years old. And by the way, the FMT re research, a lot of it is also finding that these butyrate producing clostridia are crucial to the success of a fecal microbiota transplant. I love why, it. Why yeah. Why don't we end with that beautiful thought? All right. <laughs> okay. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy holidays to everyone out there. Thanks for joining us on our, on our maiden voyage of the Gut Club podcast. Maybe we'll start doing this every Tuesday on different subjects. Who knows? All right, Stephen. Thank you very much. I'll see you in cyberspace. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye now.